it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first Courage to Be lecture of, uh, of 2017. The Courage to Be, I just, a little background since this is the first lecture, and some of you I know have heard this before, but many of you haven't, uh, started three years ago. Uh, and it was, a, it was a collaboration between the Hannah Arendt Center and the Bard Chaplaincy. Uh, there was a, a wonderful uh, um, colleague of ours who's now left us, unfortunately, uh, Nicholas Lewis, who got together with me and we talked about how we could create community and create some joint intellectual projects between the Chaplaincy and the RN Center. And um, after one or two conversations, we started talking about um, uh, political resistance and what it meant to be courage in courageous in public life. And this was an issue that Hannah Arendt wrote a lot about. She talked a lot about those who did resist during the Nazi era and those who didn't, and, and what separated them, what made some people act courageously in difficult times, in dark times, and others not. And um, one of the things she said over and over again was that it had nothing to do with education. Like the, the most educated people, many of them were the least courageous, and some of the most courageous were people who had no formal education. And, and, and so there was a question in her work of, well, what makes people courageous? What makes people act courageously? And over and again, she came down to the question of something ineffable like character. What does it mean to have character? And she thought this was particularly difficult in a secular age, in an age in which um, uh, there wasn't a sense of strong sense of who we are. And in many ways, the people who resisted, who were courageous, are people who said, well, I couldn't do anything else. That's who I am. And um, I just want to read two quotes that struck me, not from Arendt, um, that have struck me as uniquely related to what we do with the courage to be. One is from President John Adams, uh, who wrote, it was not because they loved the public better than themselves that politicians and senators acted courageously at their own risk. It wasn't because they were altruistic, he said. On the contrary, it was precisely because they did love themselves because each one's need to maintain his own respect for himself was more important to him than his popularity with others. And this sense of character, of having respect for oneself, and acting not because you're worried about what others would think, but because you couldn't live with yourself if you acted otherwise, strikes me as very much at the root of what it means to be courageous. And then the last line of the book that you're all going to read by Paul Tillich, The Courage to Be, in which Paul Tillich writes, the courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. Which is, well, if I could ever write a line to end the book that way. Um, the courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when the God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt. And this strikes me as very much the condition that Arendt saw us in, a condition of doubt, of fear, um, when we have very little faith in who we are and what we mean. And it's in that absence that um, it's very hard to act for something, uh, for ourselves, for a sense of, 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 of character, and that's, I think, the challenge of courageous action today is how do we nurture in ourselves and others um, a sense of faith in ourselves so that we will act uh, courageously, not caring what other people think because it's simply the only thing we can do. That's what the Courage to Be seminars are designed to investigate in more or less and in different ways through many different courses. And we bring in lecturers who will provide reflections on what it means to act politically and ethically in courageous ways. 
and you all get to hear them, and you're all in different courses. There's four different courses being taught on it. And one of the, pres one of the ideas here is that in these lectures, you'll meet people in courses that are different courses and yet related. And you'll begin a semester-long, and I hope college-long, discussion about moral and courage, political courageous action. That's the premise and hope that it will create a community of people interested in one of the central moral, political, and ethical conditions of our time who will investigate this together over their college career and maybe even beyond. Um, so I'm thrilled to uh, welcome you here. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, lecture tonight and semester planned. Um, you'll hear more about it. But I actually am done with uh, my introduction. I, one of the great things about this program is I get to uh, work with a number of student fellows at the Hunter Rent Center who really dive into this, help me select the lecturers, help plan them, and really take over so I don't have to do very much. And uh, tonight, three of our fellows um, are, are in charge, and I'm going to introduce them to you. Uh, one is um, Claire Harvey, who was also uh, a fellow last year, and she's a senior at Bard College studying comparative literature. Uh, I should say, writing her, 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 her thesis on Arendt and, and Auden. Um, uh, Stefan Stoyanov, Stoyanov I'm sorry, is a senior joint major in computer science and mathematics, uh, interested in artificial intelligence. And Anna Heckman, uh, who's a sophomore and human rights major here at Bard from New York. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome them, and they are going to introduce tonight's speaker. Thanks very much. Joining us today for the Courage to Be College Seminary, Seminar and Lecture Series is professor and author Penny Gill. Gill taught at Mount Holyoke for over 40 years, teaching classes in comparative politics and globalization. She has served dean of the college for several years, where her task was to help students integrate what they were learning both in and outside of the classroom. Professor Gill has recently switched gears and moved from comparative politics to comparative spiritualities. In Gill's book, What in the World is Going On? Wisdom Teaching for Our Time, she engages in a spirited and searching conversation with Tibetan teacher Manju Shri. In these discussions, Gil delves, <laughs> Gil, uh, Gil, oh, excuse me. In these discussions, Gil delves into the idea of spirit and how it transcends our world and gives us answers to the unknown. These teachings look beyond traditional religious structures and delve into spirit as it transforms our minds and hearts, connecting us even deeper to one another. It is in this presence that we can begin to understand the deep connections within the world that surrounds us. The spirit in all things binds us, not only to each object, but also to all things that engage us, such as politics, violence, poverty, and environmental crises. Gil asks us to take a leap and to believe in the spiritual universe in which we live. The courage that this book inquires about is that of heart and optimism, something both missing and suspect in our increasingly alienated world. I am very excited to welcome Professor Penny Gill to our talk tonight. It's entitled, To Whom Do You Belong? Fear, Courage, and Community. Without further ado, let's begin the discussion. Well, that was a good one. Thank you, thank you, Anna. And uh, can you guys see me over this little light? I think we're going to deal with it. Uh, I'm little, and I'm loud, so it's okay. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Delighted, delighted to meet you. I've been interested in Bard for a long, long time, because, you know, I'm just not too far away. And wonderful to find this lively, kind of slightly cantankerous intellectual atmosphere. That's the best. That's the best. And it's well worth your being here. Um, we're going to have lots of time after my talk. It's not too long. I ended up having to write it out because I got so engaged with all this stuff. This is a complicated time. This is, you know, I don't know about you, but that, I'm afraid to go out into the world sometimes because the energies are so caustic and aggressive and, and unpleasant. It feels like the world has been turned inside out or upside down. And, and we're all trying to figure out how to be our best selves 
at the same time that we figure out what in the world is going on. And this book is a couple years old, and it made some sense a couple years ago. It makes a lot more sense now. So courage is an affair of both heart and mind. And Americans, perhaps especially American intellectuals, are pretty skillful at the mind part. But we are not skillful at all at the heart part. Courage can seem heroic, and it may well be, but courage is more likely to flow from our deep connections with and our commitments to each other. In a culture marked by alienation, competitiveness, and loneliness, living with courage can seem impossible. But it surely isn't. It's a natural outcome of a life lived with depth and integrity. Now, you've probably seen that paragraph around. It's been on all the PR. So I just thought there, that's the argument. So I'm going to try to unpack that for you and see if I can uh, open up some little spaces where you can go in and take a deeper look at some of those issues. But the first question is, to whom do you belong? And who is in your circle of care? And in whose circle of care do you find yourself? So that's kind of my underlying, my underlying question. Because along with character, I loved your, your intro, Roger, you know, and, and the way Arendt talks about character. But what, what is character? And how does it grow? How do you nourish character? You know, is it a strict parent? Or is it a kind parent? Or is it, you know, all kinds of theories of education come out of that question. How do you build character? So this is my little, you know, toss at that huge question of how do we, how do we help shape a young person's integrity? We are living in an astonishing moment in American history, and it's easy to feel as if you're losing your balance. The energies are confusing and swirling, and I find myself probably just as upended as you do. What do we mean by courage? You're going to spend a whole semester thinking about that, so I'm not going to get too crazy here. But one simple meaning is that the, the, the root of the word courage is the French word cur, which means heart. And <clears throat> we say it's acting from the heart. I love all these prepositions and how they work. <laughs> it's acting with heart. We talk about having a brave or a strong heart. We admire a person who can act with courage when she's willing to act on behalf of a deep value, such as compassion, or truthfulness, or justice, or equality. And most especially, we admire someone if she can do that in the face of some danger or some risk to herself. So we get a certain kind of act, and we, get, we have to look immediately at the context and see how that act came to be shaped. Why might someone prefer not to act with courage? Avoiding harm is usually the first answer. We, we get that, we recognize that. But there are other reasons. <clears throat> is he clear about his deepest values and his commitment to them? Does she understand really what is at stake? And does it matter to her, even to the point of overriding her fear? How does he weigh short-term and long-term implications, both for himself and for others involved? As you see, there are issues of discernment here, both of oneself and of the situation that invites a response, or an intervention, or an action. Discernment, one of my favorite words, is central. And it's enormously important, for it describes meticulous, analytic thinking. And my fingers are crossed that every single day at Bard, you get a little better at that. That you practice critical, analytic, meticulous thinking. 
one of the finest things that um, the United States has offered to the world is the odd thing called a residential liberal arts undergraduate education. <laughs> and yeah, nobody else does this. And it is a phenomenal privilege, you know, a mind-boggling privilege to be here. And its main purpose is to get you to be a really skillful thinker so that that thinking gets intimately tied into your own deepest values, which you also figure out while you're at Bard. So get to work. <laughs> but I think the main obstacle to acting with courage is fear. And that's what I want to talk about mostly tonight. I think even before November, we lived in a world that is soaked in fear. We are drenched in fear. We live in a society, an economic system that drenches us with fear on purpose every day of our lives. I would argue that these great powerful systems within which we live drench us in fear in order to undermine our ability to act, our ability to question, our ability to resist. It undermines our ability to discern clearly and our ability to respond to things that we know are not okay, that we know require or ask for resistance. Our fears can persuade us we are impotent, or we are vulnerable, or we cannot make a difference. A phrase I'm beginning to loathe. You do. <laughs> our fears can make us resign ourselves to what is unjust and inappropriate and just plain wrong. We don't like to talk about fear, we Americans. We all seem to have a little cowboy or wild west in us, a little flavor of bravado, a heedlessness, uh, a macho masculine prowess. It's not masculine anymore. Women do it just as much as men do. But you know what I mean. Don't let the pain show, don't let the heartache show, pretend all is well, and maybe I will be the winner. Maybe it will all go away. Maybe someone else will fix it. But we all have been frightened, anxious, sometimes we're even terrified. So let's look at those fears. There are two kinds of fears. There's actually a continuum of fears, and I'm going to describe the two endpoints. <clears throat> One is, oh shit, there is a tiger in the grass. And you're hardwired to do the appropriate thing if you see a tiger in the grass, whatever that is, not a squirrel. You know, you're hardwired for flight, and your body knows what to do, your adrenals kick in, and off you go, and when you and the tiger are separated by a comfortable distance, your adrenals will relax and your system comes back to, to some kind of equilibrium. The other kind of fear, <clears throat> because we are human beings with something that I don't think most species have, which is our capacity for imagination. What came along, the shadow gift with imagination, is that we can create a fearful object or event in our mind and then we start to run the story out, and it goes on and on and on. Is there anyone here who's pretty convinced you'll never, ever be able to pay your college loans? <laughs> you don't have to put your hands up. <laughs> Is there is anyone sure that new U.S. policies toward long-term allies, global partners, and neighbor countries will lead to nuclear war? Is anyone scared envisioning the long-term trajectories of U.S. policies toward the vulnerable, the marginal, the outsiders? Of course you are. Of course I am. But there are different kinds of narratives I tell myself about those obvious issues. Nuclear war, climate change, inequality, domestic violence, global violence. 
the crux of this fear generating process of our very overactive minds is that the mind takes a small bit of data, we could probably agree on what the small bit of data is for each of those issues, and then we run this story out. It becomes a prediction, and shortly after that, without your noticing it, it becomes a certainty. It becomes a true thing. And after that, you are likely to be scared because it already has gathered some kind of essential being in your mind. It leaves you passive because it's already happened in your mind. It leaves you feeling powerless. It leaves you feeling impotent. And it's not surprising that your attention turns away. It can either be to some kind of self-medication that calms that fear or some other kind of distraction. But the point that I want to make is that you can watch this happening inside your mind. You can watch yourself, and it's been particularly true since November 9th, you can watch yourself start from point A and get to point Z in a second or two like that. And then your behavior and your thinking is responding to that rather than that bit of data at point A. If you don't take anything else out from the whole night, take that and start practicing watching that in your mind. You will be amazed at what you see. Why do we do this? Why do we insist on doing this to ourselves? I would argue that it's just about inescapable in our society with its intense capitalist market-driven media, with the competitive pressures of both the labor market and the selling of goods and services. We could spend, spend semesters unpacking that sentence on how the cultural values and practices engendered by a robust capitalist corporate economy, which is what we've mostly had, have isolated us in our society so marked by this, the painful individualism we know all too well. In other words, these markets create a kind of hyper-individualism. A little sliver of you is only allowed to function in that market. It creates huge amounts of loneliness and alienation and disconnection. And as you can see, that gets linked up with the production of these fearful narratives and the inability to act courageously. There's a ton to read about it. I would <coughs> urge, at the moment, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, Fred Magdoff's what every environmentalist needs to know about capitalism, they both lay out in beautiful detail how these various pieces of American society and culture and economy are linked together. If I had a big blackboard, I would write these words on it, each naming an obstacle to living with courage. Loneliness, separation, isolation, individualism, the ideology, not the business of becoming an individual, becoming who you really are. Marketing, competitiveness, vulnerability, and fearfulness. And then I'd ask you to come to the board and draw the arrows, of, of linking all of the incredible feedback loops and linkages of, of those concepts, <coughs> those experiences. How could anyone be courageous in such a world? You're asking, Roger's asking you for years now, three years worth, 70 kids a crack, 210 <coughs> kids, <coughs> young people, excuse me, <laughs> 210 people being asked to think about being courageous in an environment and in a culture, in a society that whose purpose is to prevent you from ever even having the thought, ever ever being able to imagine that it's something for you. And if it's not for you guys, Hannah Arendt asks, who can be courageous? 
So this is not in any way about guilt or blame or anything. It's trying to understand how we are embedded in a culture and a society that really doesn't want to stimulate too much courageous activity. But for the antidotes to those qualities of our contemporary life and the suffering that they cause are all to be found in our connections with each other. In other words, that's how you protect yourself from this stuff. Your connections with your friends, with your families. I imagine by now lots of you have recognized you have more than one family. That's a good idea. And with people you care about, both people you know, and people that you don't know except abstractly, that you care about specific persons, and you care about groups of people. The frightening stories we tell ourselves over and over those internal loops of narrative do not arise from your heart, nor do they arise from a careful, focused intellect. They are produced by your ever-busy little mind. And since they are fundamentally disempowering, it is unlikely that they will lead you to act with courage. There simply is nothing there that could override your fearful narrative or your discouraged conclusion that you are powerless. But real dangers rooted in your real world, where you live with those you care about and those who care about you, can indeed generate courage, great courage. Because your heart is engaged along with your mind, your discerning mind. Because you are embedded in caring relationships, your heart has a decent chance to override the fear, supply the discernment you need to evaluate risk, and then the commitment, the ingenuity, the integrity, and yes, the courage to act on behalf of yourself and those you care about. Take a moment now, if you will, please, to sit quietly, close your eyes, take a few slow, easy breaths, let the day drain out of you, and invite into your mind's eye those you love, those you care about, and those who care for you. Make a circle. So there might be someone from your family, might be other relations, your close friends, the people you love to hang out with, teammates, a lab partner, roommates. Let them gather around you. Look at each for a moment and recognize how deep the connection is. If you wish, nod in appreciation and gratitude. Relish it. This is the real thing. Now look again to see if there are others standing in the shadows, not quite in your circle. Can you see any? Do you recognize them? Perhaps they care for you. Or you can see, yeah, I'm connected with them too. Perhaps you'd like to invite some of them into your circle. Greet them as well and feel the enormous warmth of being so encircled. It's the simplest of exercises. It's just meant to give you a moment, a glimpse of quiet, so you can see what your first answer is to the question of, to whom do you belong? These are the people 
who will support you being courageous. And these are the people who will ask you to be courageous on their behalf. These folks nourish your heart so you are free and able to act on behalf of them and your own deepest values. They release your ability to know and live your own integrity. That is a pretty amazing gift. And all you have to do is not believe your recklessly imagined stories, your self-produced fears. All the rest follows. Thank you.